Hello, this is Healing Humanity Ministries, vlog number 14, How Trauma Shapes You. My name is Santiago, I'm the president and founder of Healing Humanity Ministries, and I have, I come from a very complex background. I've just experienced a lot of strange things in my life. Uh, that sometimes most people don't have to uh, or get to experience. And one of those things that I experienced in my life was an introduction to um, street life, gang life, uh, crime life, crime life a little bit. And it's strange how the timing for it was just right. Um, a lot of us kids were affected in my neighborhood, uh, in my city. And what's so strange about it is we were kids. I mean, we were children, numerically speaking, by society's standards. But we were growing up and learning the scary stuff in life much faster than we should have, or if you ever should have to. So what I'm about to talk about is um, extreme violence. <clears throat> I think one of the easiest ways to start this, I've, I've, I've really struggled talking about this to a lot of people for a long time. Uh, my wife and my family is very familiar with most of this. But, uh, all right, so here goes. Um, this is in 1990. I have some clips here, and I'm going to read them. But this is this is the start to March of 1990. I'm just going to read highlights from this newsreel, uh, and then we'll we'll talk about things. Okay, so it reads March 1990. A 15-year-old is fatally shot. The shooting stemmed from a two-year feud between the kids' friends and the 6-4 gang. <clears throat> the 6-4 the six gang and the Burt Street crew, uh, as police say, have been formed as very loosely organized gangs that fight, steal, and sometimes deal drugs. So, yeah, very loosely organized in 1990 because they were children. Children aren't supposed to be organized like that. I grew up in a strange place, in a strange setting, I guess. So, I'm half Mexican and half white. My father did two tours in Vietnam. Prior to that, he experienced the city's street life. Prior to that, they were migrant farmers, essentially, or farmers. They, they worked the fields. So as a child, my father didn't really experience much of what it means to be a child at all. When he was old enough to work, he worked. As did his siblings and <clears throat> his father and his mother and aunts and uncles and everybody else because that's what they did. He supported the family. There are migrants trying to make it in a country 
that was not yet accepting minorities. This was during the civil rights movement. And so my father really never experienced childhood as some do, as, as many do. My mother was, uh, she is um, European and, but she didn't have, she didn't have what they refer to as the white privilege. No, that doesn't go everywhere. You know, they were essentially people of poverty themselves. <laughs> They came from a large Catholic family. Um, when you got a lot of kids to feed and clothe, you know, you just don't have a lot of money for all the other stuff. And back then, there wasn't even a lot of other stuff like there is today. Okay, so my father raised me interestingly. He didn't teach me about the world. When I say he didn't teach me about the world, I'm talking about employment, finances, sex, religion, race. Um, he didn't tell, he didn't teach me um, who I was. He didn't tell me I was Mexican. He didn't tell me I was half white. So these were things that I kind of had to figure out. And then I was never told what it meant to be Mexican, what it meant to be white, what it meant to be half and half. Especially back then, following the civil rights movement. Come on, people. Smile on your brother. Back then, during, you know, this was just after the civil rights movement and the Vietnam War had just ended. And so there was this work, work hard mentality, support your family and celebrate life the rest of the time. Well, when you don't have a lot of money, there's only certain ways that you can celebrate life. But I grew up in a, a good family. They were good. You say good Catholic family, but I don't think that they're really Catholics just because you're baptized and, you know, you recognize Christmas and Easter and you pray before a meal. I don't know. Now that I've dove a little bit further into Christianity myself. Uh, but I thought I grew up, you know, Catholic and uh, they're good, wholesome people. Anyway, so our neighborhood, our house was in the neighborhood, and it was kind of like, it was definitely a working class neighborhood, for the most part. The struggling working class neighborhood, like foundry working class neighborhood, back before they paid, you know, what they pay now. So I got a lot of my information and my knowledge from the streets, as do, as do many people, I assume. All right. And so the reason I say all that is to kind of give you a little, little bit of information about my character and how I developed. So where my house was, it was like surrounded by gangs loosely um and i say loosely because a lot of gangs had their own specific neighborhoods but all these gangs i'm about to mention all this nonsense that happened in a very short period of time all of this happened but all these people you could use it was a small city i mean you bumped into each other always one mall, very small, even though it was big back in the, for, you know, back in the day, 
because there were only those strip plazas. It was a big mall back in the day. People came from miles around. All right. So I'm not sure. Okay. So here, March 1990. 6-4 gang and the Burt Street crew formed loosely. Yep. Um, March of 1990. Officers also hear of other possible gangs called 4th Street South Side Crime Syndicate. So this was March of 1990. I was... 15-ish. And, um, though I, I think I'll blog about other things here, uh, later on with it, but I was about 15-ish and I had been bullied and bullied and bullied and nobody explained to me why I was, get, I was getting bullied by white people for being Latino. I was getting bullied by Latinos for being white. It was, it was hitting me from both sides. I was getting physically assaulted. Um, and this started in like kindergarten. Seriously. And I had no idea why or what was going on. Back then our parents didn't talk to us, you know. Um, it just wasn't something you did with your kids. You Not this generation of this culture. They, they raised us, kept us alive in, in hopes that we would do something well. But we were never really taught anything. Well, at least the people that I knew weren't. White, black, Mexican, none of us. Anyway, um, so yeah, this is 19... And the gangs have been active in Saginaw since way before then, you know? But they were... They, they used to beat each other up and steal from each other and, and sell, you know pot or something acid but it wasn't anything crazy but craziness was about to come and I was 15 years old I was tired of getting bullied I was tired of getting bullied by even teachers would bully me And I'm not even talking about the little stuff. I'm talking about the bigger stuff. When it got physical or when it made me think. This world sucks. As a child. And uh, I didn't do that well all the way through school. Um, I, I failed. I was a D minus average student. Back then, they just pushed you along, pushed you along, pushed you along. There was no no child left behind, you know? They didn't leave you behind. They just pushed you along. <laughs> I mean, I never got held behind. I, I, I've been suspended, expelled. I should have been, I should have been, I should have. All right, so here we are. Next, it says, this reading says, and this is all from the, the, the newspaper back then and the police reports. The difference between, oh, he says it right here. The difference between these gangs and previous gangs, such as the Clicks and Crazy Eights, I remember the Crazy Eights, is the availability of guns and the influx of crack cocaine. I don't know where the guns came from. And thinking about it now, it's like, where did those guns come from? I understand cocaine. Cocaine's easy to move. And that was coming across from uh, Mexico, but coming up through Guatemala. They were pushing cocaine everywhere. I don't know where the guns came from, though. But the gangs didn't really have them, you know? You heard of people getting shot. No, not shot. You got. You heard of people getting beat up. There's a rumble, they used to call it. There's a rumble. Because they'd all meet up at a certain place. It was intentional. And they took bats and chains, which I guess is pretty dangerous. But they didn't go to the extent they, they do now. They didn't go to the extent that they started to in the 90s. 
All right, so here I am, 15 years old. So here we go. 464, so that's not 464, that's not an area code. There was a gang called 64. I remember 64 in the posse, but, or 64 in Sunnyside. Anyway, a couple different gangs I'm putting together here. That's just how we, I recall talking about them. Um, anyway, there were four of their members uh, tell the Saginaw News that they weren't involved in a recent homicide, and they told the news, we've laid some heads to bed, but they but they lying about us now. That's a quote. And it's kind of funny when you know who said these things. Um, it's not funny. It's sad. But, uh, okay, so here in uh, June now, a 21-year-old is shot fatally in a gang-related incident. In July, a 17-year-old and an 18-year-old are beaten and shot to death in a gang-related incident. And then, uh, so that was July of 1990. School's out, streets are hot, and they got so much hotter. Um, in, in the three weeks preceding those two kids uh, getting getting killed, there was 25 drive-by shootings. Um, a 15-year-old was charged with murder of the 18-year-old. He got 17 years. In August, end of the summer, a 24-year-old was killed in a, in a gang shooting. In 1990, August, the state of Michigan awards $100,000 grant to the Saginaw Police Department for a community officer in the Daniels Heights neighborhood. The money was only to pay for salary. That neighborhood was hot, 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 hot. You could have paid me a million dollars to walk through that neighborhood back then with the police officer's uniform on. No, sir. October 90, a drive-by shooting. Yeah, the cops stopped and questioned um, some 6-4 members, some Latin Crips, and some folks. So this is the first time you hear about uh, Latin, he calls it Latino Crips, but it's Latin Crip. It was Latin Crips and the folks. This is really the first time you hear them coming in October 1990. And uh, now, it, now it gets crazy. In 91, a 23-year-old is struck and killed in a shootout with a rival gang member. Saginaw, oops, I didn't want to say the name of the city. But now Saginaw needs a, uh, a gang task force, which was first formed in 1990 because the summer got crazy hot. So here's the, the, the main part that I became involved. And I'll restart this whole video if I, if I mention any names. <clears throat> because uh, there can't be any names named. But in July of 91, there was a 13-year-old boy that was shot in the head. Uh, as he was walking down the street with members of the folks gang when a confrontation with Mafia King members began. This young boy who was killed was a member of a gang called the Pee Wees. And they were like the little kids, the nieces and, or the nephews and little cousins and brothers um, of the folks. So they were called Pee Wee Folks. And this is where you have like these, you know, seventh graders, just ch absolute children are getting serious now. Anyway, when that happened, uh, because it was a mafia king that killed that kid, 
Saginaw caught on fire. In July of 91, uh, a 19-year-old dies after he's shot in the chest. Moments after, another uh, 18-year-old asked people at a party to leave the house because members of the folks and Mafia Kings were present for a, a graduation party. It was so strange to live through that, not to like make it out of there. It was so strange to experience that because I would be at parties, simple, you like this here, a graduation party, or you just stopping by, you know, your cousin's house and surprise, surprise, there's other teenagers there from a rival gang. And they start throwing signs, you start, it's, it's just, there was a lot of crazy things that were going down that started all of this. Um, but there was, there was media that definitely influenced it. We went from the 80s with, I built the city on rock and roll, to the 90s. With Dre, Snoop, Cube, Nas, Tupac, Biggie. You had all these people that were now standing up for their rights and for who they were. And they were doing it through media. Through rap and through movies. They were telling the, their story. They were telling their truth. But what it did for us is we said, we have the same story. And that's how we're going to start to stand up for our story too. You know, we didn't have any peaceful, I don't know, anybody, nobody was providing for the kids in the sense of what do you do? How do you run these streets? How do you own these streets? How do you... So, there's a couple, like, littler things I'm not going to read about, you know, drive-bys and stuff. In 92, a member of the Mafia Kings shoots a member of the folks. Then this 18-year-old tells a jury during his trial for shooting this person that Saginaw gang members trade gunfire almost every time we see each other everybody had a gun everybody had a gun and everybody wanted to use it and nobody was afraid to use it because the police weren't ready for any of that you know when I had heard about Fast forward 15 years later, so <laughs> I'm a police officer myself. And uh, there was not training for any of that. Nobody was ready for any of that. Nobody was ready for young kids to start carrying weapons and have no fear of loss of life or consequences. In August of 92, let me just tell you, it's like every month it got hot. It was like, it was like bacteria. It was growing quickly. You ever see bread get moldy? That's how the gangs from the, in the nineties, I'd say the early 1990 to touching on to the two thousands, the whole nineties, it was just an infestation it was crazy. So, um, in August of 92, a 20 year old was fatally shot when he and a 19 year old fired 13 rounds into a house. 
As the 19-year-old started shooting, a resident of the house grabs a gun and returns two shots, striking each of the shooters. August 92, four teenagers, ages 15 to 18, were shot when members of the Latin Crips go to the location seeking members of the Mafia Kings. Someone in a building on Lamson opens fire with a shotgun at the group of 15 people, hitting four in the face and chest. 23-year-old is fatally shot as he and others are leaving a party. When a gang shootout begins, one of them was sentenced to 12 to 17 years in prison for manslaughter. In March of 93, a brawl between two gangs erupts Inside the Foot Locker store, man, it was always dangerous at the Foot Locker. I seen people get killed over and over Jordans. That's insane. You were OG if you wore Jordans, though, because you were kind of saying. Let me see what you got. <laughs> All right, so uh, March of 93. So there's this fight inside a Foot Locker, and a witness says, it's a female, a young female, and she says, a guy grabbed my baby's stroller and just started beating somebody with it. The worst part is, when he grabbed the stroller, he didn't even check to see if there was a baby in it. It was weird. People, we were just, it was crazy. August of 93, there's mention of it here called Aces High. I ran, I, so Aces High, I, I recall them Aces High No Purpose. October 93, police arrest somebody who they said was the leader of the Mafia Kings. In October 93, one of the founding members of the Folks is shot hours after joining fellow gang members at a Halloween party for children. December 93, an argument between Folks and Mafia Kings at the mall leads to six shots fired. March of 94, a 10-year-old girl is shot in the thigh when two teenage boys see a rival gang member in open fire. April of 94, the Saginaw Gang Crime Task Force begins operating forces with the FBI, Secret Service, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, Michigan State Police, the Sheriff's Department, the State Police, BV Police, the FBI senior agent will be heading that unit. So, It's really strange to talk about like where I came from and <clears throat> so the way I got involved was I had reached my limit. I had been beaten and beaten and beaten and beaten. I was tired of getting beaten. And uh, nobody taught me how to not be beaten to the point that I walked by my neighbor's garage one day and seen him out there and he was uh, he was a tough he was a tough guy I think he's from Jersey but this guy I was 
I'm guessing 14 or 15, and this guy was hit, hitting his bag in his garage, working his bag, working the heavy bag, lifting weights. And he looked he looked like a skinny Rambo, but a tough skinny Rambo. And I went to him, and uh, I was like, hey, can you teach me how to do some of that? And I had to ask him because my, my father... I almost said my old man. Uh, my my father was uh, he he wouldn't let that happen because he didn't want me to be fighting. He didn't want me to be involved in that. But he didn't teach me any defense, so I was just a punching bag, <laughs> which is all good though because you know that first punch is the worst. Getting that first punch when you're not expecting it, you know, you're like, what was that? That second punch, when you are expecting it, that's probably worse because you knew you should have known how to do something about it. Oh, at least move. But nobody taught me anything. Nobody taught me to, you know, they say uh, there's fight, light, and freeze. And I was a freeze. I was definitely a freeze. I learned to become a flight, <laughs> but I was a freeze for, for most of my life. And I, when you freeze up, then you get beat up. It's not like people stop, you know, in the hood. People don't stop pounding on you because you're down. You just made it easier for them. They're not a bear. Don't drop to the ground when you start to get beat up. <laughs> uh, work on the work on the flight. Work on the flight. So I asked this guy. And uh, I said, hey, man, can you help me? He says, hey, you know, I'd love to. If uh, if it's all right with your dad, go ask your dad if it's all right. So I walked around the corner. <clears throat> he lived like three houses around the block from me. I walked around the corner and waited for like 10 minutes. And, and then I went back. <laughs> I was like, hey, my, my dad says, yeah, yeah, go for it. So he taught me to box, and he taught me to take a hit, and uh, he taught me to, uh, you know, throw some back, and he taught me how to lift weights. Wasn't interested in it. It was too much work. I liked hitting the bag, though. It felt like I was getting some revenge, um, and I probably did that like three or four times. It wasn't a lot, but it was a tap into it. It was an introduction to you can do something. Um, at least for me. So, um, there was another time that So I was going to this one school, right? And it was a Catholic school and you had to dress a certain way. So everybody knew you're Catholic. That sucked. And my dad was late picking me up uh, from school. I think I was in the seventh grade and maybe eighth. Anyway, he was late picking me up. I was the last one there. I was sitting out front waiting. And while I'm waiting for him outside of the school, you know, I think it was like fall time. Um, there was nobody, no cars, no nothing around. These two kids come walking down the street and I'm out front of the school, kind of stuck into a corner. I was trying to hide a little bit, um, but they were definitely able to see me. And they came towards me, and they were probably two two years older than me, I would say, by their size on me. I was just a little skinny guy. Yeah. 
But they uh, they started whooping on me. They wanted my money. They told me, give me your money. You got any candy? You got any money? And, you know, think about it now. That was, that was like, a, that was armed robbery. <laughs> I've been, I've been robbed so many times, not not like too many times, but enough times that where most people haven't even been robbed. All right, so here I am in the corner, and uh, these two kids are, you know, it starts with pushing me around, and then they're like trying to rip my coat off, trying to get my pockets, punching me, holding me up against the wall. And just out of nowhere, this kid, another kid that was about their size, um, this Mexican kid, these other two kids that are upon me are white. And this Mexican kid comes up and throws, like grabs them and th he's got leather gloves. He has leather gloves on and a black leather trench coat. He's got a black shirt and he's got a hat on backwards. And... Um, so I'm familiar with the look because that's how a lot of people in my neighborhood dress. Unfortunately, I don't go to school in my neighborhood. My parents wanted something better for me. So they sent me to another neighborhood who was pretty much just as bad off. And uh, so he comes and, and he throws a whooping on him too. And I leave, I run. And uh, I'm, I'm able to look back so I'm able to look back and I find out that this guy kind of, you know, he, he whooped on him and I ran. And that hit me really hard that somebody, the light just went out, that somebody was there for me. Somebody was there to take care of me. And I even know who this guy is to this day. And one of these days I'm going to reach out to him, maybe. But he took care of those two for me. I ran. I was safe. What? Something strange just happened and I lost my main light. So I don't know if... Uh, I hope you can still see me well enough. So, uh, yeah. that that I got jumped. He, he jumped them. I ran. I contemplated on that for, for a good bit longer. I went to another school... Um, and that was, that was just as awful. Got, got pushed around a lot, got beat up a lot. When I say a lot, I say I probably got pushed around three out of five days a week. And I probably got assaulted three out of five days a week, maybe two at least physically, verbally assaulted every day. Um, and that was just because I was, I was dumb. I didn't know anything. No, I, I, I hadn't been taught anything yet. I wasn't taught how to socialize. I wasn't taught how to be respectful. I wasn't taught how to defend myself. I wasn't taught how to defend others. I wasn't taught about what bullying was there. I mean, there wasn't like a move on bullying until like the twenties or the two thousands. So in the early nineties, when kids were getting bullied and before then it was like, suck it up, do something about it or suck it up, move on. You just, that was life at least for some people. So I did, I sucked it up. I stored it. I <laughs> I started as future depression and anxiety. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so check this out. Uh, now I'm in the 10th grade, I think. And I'm going to this other high school. That was from my neighborhood. I told my parents, I was like, yeah. I was like, I'm done. I'm done. I'm not taking it anymore. I'm not getting bullied anymore. I was like, if you send me to school, I said, I'll go right through the back. I said, like, I don't care. I'll drop out. Don't matter. Ain't happening. And you 
you know, back then you just learned how to play it off. You know, when somebody punched you and you don't know what to do, you, you kind of laugh and ha 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 ha, you know, or when they steal your money or, you know, it's just like the movies show it today. It's an ugly situation. But anyway, so I started going to this other school, uh, a public school in my neighborhood. And like first day, no joke. I meet this kid. We're in a class together and we're out in the hallway. And, you know, back then it was crazy. It was like the movies. Um, this would have been 91, I think. And this, this is when my life changed. We're at 50, 40, we're at, well, 41 minutes. My life changed. So I was, I had been confronted. Uh, all right. So let me show you, let me give you up the parking lot for the school I'm at. Um, it's all one level school, but it's really, really spread out in different patterns and stuff and L shapes. So the classes are in all these different shapes. But you get breaks and you get like extended breaks. Like you get a 15 minute, you get a couple 15 minute breaks to, I don't know, stretch your legs. Back then, 15 minute break meant go outside. Do stuff you shouldn't do, smoke, drink. A lot of kids skateboarded. A lot of kids rode their bikes and BMX tricks. And other than that, it was just like, I don't know. It was crazy. The, uh, anyway, so I got confronted by somebody. He wanted to fight me. And I was, I was like, yo, I still didn't know what I was doing. I was like, man, now, now this guy, I was like, this stuff is just attracted to me. I had a little bit of a mouth on me though, you know, and, uh, this, this, we called them, what's up dog? We call them dogs back then. What's up homie? One of my homeboys, soon to be homeboy, like really soon to be homeboy, stepped up. And his cat's like built. And you know he's he's kind of a known scrapper. <laughs> and uh he handled it for me. He's like, You ain't messing with this dude, man. You gonna mess with this dude, I'm gonna hurt you and your family. <laughs> Essentially it went down like that and it was squashed. I didn't really know the guy. He didn't know me, so it didn't matter. But I had never stood any taller than that before. I had never had, I had never been proud of anything, really, I don't think. I had never been accepted by anybody for a good reason. You know, I had never been accepted by anybody because they liked me. That's what I'll call a good reason. I had been accepted because, you know, I would do something stupid or I would wear reckless, you know, in the neighborhood. But I was never accepted by anyone just for straight up wanting to accept me. So this impacted my life big. And he's like, yo, come on with me. And so we rode together, we rode tight for, for many years, but he was, he was already, he was, a, he was a, in a, affiliated with the Mafia Kings. And at this point, this is in the, in 91, I believe, at this point, this is something I was familiar with, but I had never been inside. I was familiar with it because I had seen people on the street, 7-Eleven, or different different uh, restaurants, in the mall, for sure. Um, so that was a huge experience for me, is instead of taking another beating, somebody was there for me. And... 
One second, I'm going to take a drink. I'm not going to pause it. I prefer to pause it and then take a drink, but whatever. So this guy had been there for me and like nobody had ever been there for me. And like, like it happens in the movies, that's how it happens. And that's how it should happen with real friends and Christianity and everything. Imagine, you know, you standing up for somebody and then finding out they need Jesus. And you, you, not only are you able to stand up for them, but then you walk them to the Lord. But this guy didn't walk me to the Lord, but he did provide me what I needed and what God had in, plan, in store for me. It had all been written. I believe. Let's see. So, from that day forward, everything that I read to you, or read to this camera, prior, I, I either definitely knew about it, or I was there, witnessed it. It just really boggles my mind now how, because it wasn't on fire. Saginaw wasn't on fire. And when I say on fire, I mean like out of control and everything's dangerous and hot. And what I remember is that 13 year old kid getting shot. And I knew it right when he got shot. I was like, everything's. It's going to go crazy. I didn't know him, but I knew the family. I knew of the family. And it's a big family. And I knew I knew there were folks. I couldn't believe we'd be at, you know, we'd be hanging out. And there would be kids there that were, man, nine, ten, eleven. Years old throwing gang signs, wearing colors, packing. It's a really interesting story how God pulled me out of that situation. I didn't think I would live through it, I thought I would have died through it. By the age of 18, I had already seen people shot. I had already been involved in shootings. I'd been with people that were shot. I had been and probably three or four drive-by shootings where I wasn't in it, but I was at the party. I was at the gathering and pop, 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 pop. And you, it caused a panic and everybody ran, but people didn't run away back then. The girls did. The guys grabbed clips and ran towards it and jumped in cars and chased it. I put my family through, my mother and my father, I had put them through a living hell, which even though it gave me insanely crazy experience, I'm eternally remorseful for what I did to my parents. You know, and I did a good job of it for like two years, not bringing it home. But then one day they found me and it came home. The house had been shot up, 
Cars busted up, windshields busted out. My car was shot up. The the police, the FBI, the DEA, the SWAT team raided my parents' house looking for stuff, looking for me. They had my parents on the middle of the living room floor. And, um, you know, in this in the assumed position. But, though that was definitely my fault. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. Um, the streets ate me up, but the streets saved me too. I don't know where I'd be if it wasn't for the gang life saving me. It saved me, I think, because I had a good heart. I was able to... I ain't cause trouble. I ain't have people looking for me. I mean, if, if if you were getting shot at, if it was personal, you did something. And I never did anything to anybody. I would do stuff for people. So I, I usually had power points. I usually had points on my side. But I got, I mean, I have friends in, in Aces High, No Purpose, these are different gangs. My my closest friends were in the Mafia Kings. I have friends in the Latin Kings. I have friends in the Folks. I have friends in um, Bird Street, 6-4. I haven't thought about any of these names for a long time. When things got really hot, I had already been enlisted in the Marines. And so when my date when my court date came, I went to court. When my court date came, my recruiter said, and my father had, thank you, Dad, thank you, Dad, thank you, thanks, Pops. My dad had shelled out. A lot of money for an attorney. A lot of money that he didn't have. And uh, but I was headed to the core, so I got to go. I got to go to the core. A lot of my friends uh, were arrested and ended up doing time. <clears throat> Now, things were different back then. There was no internet. There were no cell phones or nothing. So you found out information by letter or you had to, like, know people that would, like, tell you stuff. Even the phone. Like, when I was in the Marines, I was overseas. So when I when people had stuff to tell me, they'd be like, hey, can you want to accept a collect call? I'd be like, Shh, not at those rates. <laughs> But I, I got lucky and, and God saved me. Um, I had a warrant out for my arrest and they found my mom. My mom uh, wrote me. I actually got a letter and I'm reading this letter. And I'm like, oh, no. So I had a warrant out for my arrest after a lot of stuff went down. And a general, luckily, I worked in the general's office. Like when the president would come, it was Clinton at the time when he would come, that's like where he would stop first. And so I worked in an office with a lot of power. And when I got this news, I told my my captain, Captain Oaks. I said, Captain, I was like, I'm in trouble, sir. And I told him the story of everything that had happened. And he's like... Estrada, do you want to stay in the Marines? 
I was like, or go back to Saginaw and go to prison? Nope. I want to stay in the Marines, sir. And uh, so they had the general call the sheriff's department. And they talked to the judge. And he said, listen, this guy's over here. He's a, he's a great Marine. He's done his job. He's done doing well. If you want him, you have to pay. You got to come get him. And I was on the other side of the world in the jungle. And uh, so they, they dropped all charges against me. I was no longer considered a witness. I had no ties, no strings attached. As long as I got an honorable discharge. And so there was some motivation for you, right? Get that honorable discharge. That was all the work of God, you know. That was definitely a miracle because um, the charges that they had on me were real and they were uh, many, many, many long felonies. But what I had gotten into right before we left was for right before I left for the Marines was um it was it was like okay it was nothing like that was unheard of it wasn't different you know it's different to get caught praise Jesus I love you Lord So that's a little bit of a look into my life and other, other, um, other vlogs will, will talk about more things that happen and how they occurred. But I said the name of this vlog is Trauma Shapes You because all of that had prepared me already for the Marines. Somebody yelling at me, somebody beating me up, somebody shooting at me, me shooting at somebody. But it came with three meals a day and it gave me a place to stay and I got to travel the world and I got paid for it. And I got to get out of the hood. I'm out. Let's do it. Celebration. Hallelujah. So, uh, yeah, I did my time. Um, a bunch of others were supposed to come with me. By the time I had gotten out, um, now I had heard, like I was saying, I had heard through the mail things were not going well back in Saginaw. So I was out from 93 to 90, 98, essentially. And... I had heard about a lot of my, a lot of my partners, a lot of homies, homeboys getting shot, getting killed. I lost a few good people. Most of them went to prison. It was crazy. Some people stayed in it and tried to stay hard and stay in the game. When I got out of the Marines, I went back home and it was weird. It was different. So I didn't, I didn't stay too long. I started to get back into this street thing and I was like, what am I doing here? What am I doing? So I jumped back out. Uh, so I moved around. I lost a lot of contacts in my life. I lost a lot of friends. I've lost a lot of, I don't know. I lost a lot of experience. I wish I would have been able to be part of that fun, athletic crowd. You know, the football and basketball players, and they all hung out and they were friends. And the cheerleaders. But that's not the narration that God put before me. That's all right. I missed out on all that, but I'm doing this now. 
this is where I am now. So I'm going to wrap that blog up, this blog up here. Uh, just how trauma shapes you and who you are. Just trauma, it does things to the body too. Not only your brain, but, you know, I spent, I've, I've probably spent, I don't know, the last 10 years I've been in and out of a wheelchair. Right now I'm in a wheelchair. Because my pain is so bad I can't walk. Most of the time, sometimes it bothers me and it gets to me and I'll talk about that too. But most of the time I'm all right with it. Um, because because of what I've done and what I've seen, I know how pain affects the body and eats away at the body. Um, but so do all those negative circumstances. So does all that pain that you put out into the world. It all comes back. All the pain you put out comes back. So stop putting pain out because the pain comes back. So, boom, that's the end of vlog 14, how trauma shapes you. Uh, I didn't really tell how it shapes you, but the idea is there, and it gives you a little bit of a background on who I am and where I've come from. That will always be a big part of who I am, those years gangbanging. Because it's like... You ever meet somebody and you don't know you you meet somebody and you know them for like two months but in that two months there's a couple tragic things that happen and you really sit down and you talk to each other and spend time with each other these conversations usually happen at least in my experience in hospitals or in funeral homes <laughs> you know where those deep-seated communications those deep-seated conversations are at so you can grow closer to somebody in two months like that then you can grow then you grow to somebody in 10 years when you're like ah yeah yeah and you barely know them you, you know you hang out once in a while yeah I know this guy for like 15 years but this guy here I met two weeks ago and we're already closer than brothers um, it's just how it works but it works the same with everyday situations you know, if you've never experienced trauma and then one day you experience trauma, you learn a lot in that situation. You learn so much and all that, just like the Bible says about sacrifice, um, not only sacrifices, but pain, suffering. You learn a lot in suffering in such a little bit of time. Tell you what, grab, take a hornet and squeeze it in your hand just like this and then let it go. <laughs> You're going to learn so much in that short period of time. If you talk about real things, you learn a lot in a short period of time. If you talk about nonsense, you learn nothing over a very long period of time. So that's what I want to do with this vlog is just talk about real things. People don't talk about real things enough and we don't help each other enough because we're all afraid of each other because everybody thinks we're being judged and we're living differently. If the world judged me right now, believe me, they would have every right to. <laughs> but I've paid my debts. I have literally literally financially and figuratively i've paid my debts and jesus has set me free and that is really what this is all about don't go through this nonsense don't put yourself through chaos find jesus go to jesus once you're ready and you submit to jesus jesus will accept you with no problem at all and you won't even want to go back and experience the madness Half the things that I experience in life, most people don't want to experience. Or you just want to watch a movie on it and then cry at the end. Just kidding. So, alright. God bless. Much love.